Have you ever had a moment when all you could do was hold on? I would imagine you have if you look at this series of pictures here. There, these are scenes uh, from my life experiences of, of times when I've just held on. A friend of mine, we went, used to go rock climbing and rappelling, and, and part of the secret was learning just to hold on. When I was first starting in the ministry, there was a group of teenagers who took me to a lake, and their intent was to take me and just rip in the inner tube and just slam me into the lake, and we were having a great time, and all you could do was hold on. Learning how to uh, you know, teach my daughter how to drive or my son how to drive, there, there are moments when you just, you just hold on. A few weeks ago, walking my daughter down the aisle to be, to be married, as I walked our daughter down the aisle, just, just holding on. Roller coasters, parachuting when I turned 40, those are experiences along the way where I just learned hold on. And, and what's fascinating is along the way with God, I've had the same experience. One time when I was a, a teenager on a mission choir trip with our students from our church, out in Galveston, Texas, I walked along the beach. I had a, an encounter with God. And the results were just learning how to hold on. As I was walking the streets of Atlanta, working for a law firm on my way to lunch one time, again, a God encounter. And what flowed out of that was, again, God saying, hold on. Uh, a brief time after that, battling some uh, personal dilemmas and some uh, dilemmas in the local church, Stood at a lake on a really, really cold night, blowing snow, icy everywhere. And, and, and I just had a moment where God said, I want you to hold on. And so during this series, I don't know your starting point. You, you might be at a really sad moment right now, a moment of depression or discouragement. You might be at a moment where you're wondering what you need to do. You have no idea what that next step needs to be. You might be at a moment where you're just going through life and you feel as if everything's fine. You're just going as you've been going for a while. You're coming out of COVID and you're like, hey man, just back into the, into the groove and God's going to encounter you. You're going to have an experience with Him. And God's going to just con communicate to you the need to hold on. And so today I'd like us to start with a guy known all through the New Testament. Most of us know him as the Apostle Paul, but before that he was called Saul, and he was what we would call a terrorist. And Saul lived in what I would call the land of delusion. Now again, don't be too amped up or upset, but this might describe you. I've been there many times where what I thought was true and what I was holding on to was costly. It was, in my case, costing myself some things, but with Saul, it was actually costing people their lives. And we open up in the book of Acts chapter 7, and we see a crowd angered at this guy named Stephen. And they're, they're so mad at him and frustrated with him, and they're angered with him that they literally drag him out of the city, taking stones and rocks, and kill him. I mean, they literally stone him to death. And when he dies, they lay his feet at, the, at, at uh, this guy named Saul. Saul's there affirming, as we see in Acts chapter 8. Saul affirms his death. He says, yes, this is a good thing. And then Saul, with murderous threats, goes from house to house. And he doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. He doesn't care who you are. He's dragging you off to death or to prison. And his intent is to rid the world of this horrible, horrible thing in his mind. That is the truth of Jesus Christ. And Saul wanted not just to get rid of it in Jerusalem. He wanted to rid the entire earth of any understanding of it, any belief of it whatsoever. Now, many have speculated that maybe he wrestled with depression or discouragement, or perhaps um, he had a moment of insanity. But Saul says, no, no, no. I, I know, later he writes, I, I know what I was doing. I, I was persecuting the church of God. My intent was to try to destroy it. There, there was no insanity on his behalf. There was a guy living in the land of delusion and just believing what he was doing was of God. Imagine what it would be like to believe that you're doing something from God resulting in killing people. And that was this guy. And so we pick him up in Acts chapter 9. And if you have a Bible, whether it's online, virtual, paper, whatever, man, open it up to it and look at this with us. In Acts chapter 9, we find the story of this guy, Saul. He's on his way to Damascus. Lots of, uh, of uh, synagogues were there. Lots of Jewish people were there. And there was obviously a growing number of believers that were there as well. And on his way uh, to, to Saul, Saul was in going there to just, again, drag people off, take them away uh, from all they were believing in Christ. And we come to Acts chapter 9, verse 3, and we see his encounter with God. It's a bright light. 
It's a loud voice. And at that moment, Saul is, is asked this question by Jesus himself. Saul, Saul, why, why do you persecute me? Now, you, you might wonder, you know, how, how, did, how did he become this madman? What, what resulted in him getting to this point? You might be surprised. We'll start in Philippians chapter 3. And, and he writes how he saw life in regards to the law. He was a Pharisee, zealous, persecuting the church. He was faultless. I mean, he was a guy who was passionate about Jewish rules and beliefs. He was a guy passionate about what he felt was true about God. And yet, he totally missed God completely. We come back to Galatians chapter 1, and he says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age. He was not only passionate, he was exceptional. I mean, he was a guy in his own mind earning credits with God, with his passion, with his vengeance, with his hatred, with his murderous threats, with all that he was doing. He was thinking, man, I'm earning credits with God. I, I'm, I'm the best of the best of the best. And then we come to Acts chapter 9, verse 5. And we find something interesting as he's laying on his back and the light's there and he hears the voice in his own mind, a man who knew the Old Testament like no one else. He, he resonates in understanding this has got to be of God. And he says, you know, these words, who are you, Lord, understanding? I don't understand why I'm having this moment because here I am doing something good for you, God. Here I am getting rid of this horrible, nasty threat of Christianity. What, what, you know, who are, what, what, what's going on here? And we come to verse 5 again at the latter part. And he said, here's the words, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now you read that, it may not be near as powerful as you might think, but think for a moment how many times he had heard the word Jesus. And we, we turn back to Acts 7 where we were and, and, and with, with Stephen getting stoned and Saul was standing there affirming everything that was going on. And as that was happening, we see that Stephen cries out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And you can imagine how many times along the way that Saul had had that experience. He was dragging someone away, he might have been murdering someone, slitting someone's throat, pounding them, beating them, uh, just, you know, mauling them. And at that moment, they would cry out, Lord Jesus, help me, save me, deliver me, forgive him. Je you know, you can imagine how many times he had heard that. And, and, and when he heard it in the past, it enraged him. The moment someone said those words, Lord Jesus, I mean, he could feel his blood pressure go through the roof and he was just angry with all that was going on. But at this moment, the very one that in, just infuriated him said, it's me. I'm the one that you're persecuting me. So you can imagine, you know, as these guys were on their way to, uh, on their way, how many times they were just, you know, riding their horses and mocking and making fun of Christians and, and angrily saying, we're going to wipe them off the face of the earth. I mean, you can imagine the arrogance they had. And we go to Acts chapter 9, and we see that Saul stood there speechless. He, and, and the others that were there heard the voice, heard the sound, but, but they didn't hear anybody. And Saul got up, and he opened his eyes, and he could see nothing. And so what we'd like to understand about Saul for a moment is Saul had lived his entire life blinded by false beliefs, beliefs that he believed were firmly true. He fully believed them to be true. And at this moment, he was totally blinded. He could see nothing, and yet he could clearly see what was really true. You see, for some of us, God does that. He, he literally just runs into our lives, and His intent is to say, what you had believed, what you firmly were convinced in understanding as true was not. And now, you're, you know, you're just kind of caught off guard. You really don't know what to think, but at this moment, you're finally seeing something that really is true. We, we go back to Philippians chapter 3, where we were a moment ago, and you might wonder, how in the world did he believe this? Well, you see his journey to this point. He was raised to understand that all he believed of God was true. His family, his culture, his synagogue all taught him what he believed to be true. He was just a byproduct of all that upbringing. And it turned out the very things he'd been taught his entire life, the very things he'd understood 
were not true at all. Now, where, where might you and I have an encounter with this like this? Well, you know, the Bible describes itself this way. It is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. Every, every page of the Bible that we read is, comes from the mind and the heart of God. It's useful for... Now, we like the encouraging part, right? We, we like the, the teaching part and the training part. But it also says it's useful for correcting and rebuking. And there are moments when we open the Bible and God just wrecks our life because He says, I want to show you something that is true that's totally contrary to something you've always thought was true. Where might else this take place? Well, what, what about a pastor? Maybe our message here online or maybe the church that you attend or the Bible study that you go to. Uh, in the presence of God, Paul challenged his protege, Timothy. The same guy Saul became Paul and he's challenging him. He says, preach the word prepared in, e- in season, out of season. Here we go to correct, rebuke, and encourage. Yes, even when you're hearing a message, whether it's on a watching it on a DVD or online or or attending at your local church, on occasion, God, again, just steps through that person and wreaks havoc in your life and mind because we believed something for a long time we thought was true that turned out not to be true at all. And our tendencies, and there's nothing new here, Paul writes, is we want to suit our itching ears with what we want. We read the books we want, we listen to the people we want, we pick and choose the truths we want, and we just keep affirming again and again and again the things that we want to be true, that we might have been taught to be true, and God has to step in sometimes and just wreck our lives because He wants to bring His truth into the lies that we believed. So, do you want an example? What's an example that you've been taught I've been taught, we've been raised to believe to be true. It's, it's a normal, natural thing for all of us. Paul writes again, in the Roman Empire it was true, in modern America it was true. Paul writes in, mark this, in, in the last days, and, and we've been living in the last days since Jesus returned to heaven. What it says, people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, now think how many times you and I take our own pleasure and God, and weave the things together, thinking that God's always out to bring us and please us pleasure, uh, pleasurably. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, as you and I begin uh, thinking about it, we love pleasure way more than we love God. We choose to do the thing that makes us feel good over God most of the time, whether it's church, Bible study, prayer time, quiet time, you know, leaving things to go and follow God, bold witnessing, prayer, pr- powerful praying, and whatever they might be, those are the things that hold us back. Now, now you're sitting there thinking, wait, wait, but Saul was a lost man. I'm a saved person. I believe in Jesus. Would, would God really just kind of wreck my life, step into my life as a saved person? Would, would God allow some challenges to come my way intentionally? Well, we go to Hebrews chapter 12, and the writer of Hebrews shares some insight with us there. Hey, endured hardship is discipline. God's treating you as children. And the writer continues, if you're not disciplined, everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not a legitimate child. And so the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand God will indeed allow challenges and hardships and difficulties to come our way because God's using that to teach us something, to show us something, again, to bring His truth into the dark places and the lies that we believe. And you might think, does he love me? He does because he's helping you and me to understand. Like Saul, we're believing something that is a total and complete fabrication. It's a lie. We might have been taught it being raised. And again, in our church, in our belief system, in our family, in our culture, in our heritage. And God says it's not true. And and we continue. We go to verse 9. And we've all had human fathers, human parents who disciplined us. and, And they did it. You know, and we respected them for it. Haven't you? I mean, haven't you? I, I remember a time in my life when I was in college and I goofed off one semester, pledged to fraternity and got involved in some just stuff I just didn't need to be doing. Had to drop a class and, and my dad said, okay, now you drop the class, but this summer I'm going to need you to take that class. And so I had to go to a private university to take the class. And as I turned in my paperwork, the lady at the table slid across the bill and, you know, how much it was going to cost. My mom was standing there 
and, and my parents had been generously taking care of my college. And uh, I had taken, you know, helped some things, but they took care of the balance. At that moment, I just slid the paper over to my mom, and, and my mom slid it back and said, your dad said, since you dropped it, you've got to pay for it. And at that moment, I, I felt a, a temporary hurt and pain and rejection. But as I began to think about it, my father was teaching me, my mom was teaching me a, a powerful lesson. That it, and sometimes in life, when you choose the selfish path, there's a price tag linked to it. And the path getting back to where you need to get to can sometimes be costly. And yes, it hurts. And, in, and at that moment, it may not seem fair, but that's the way it works. And then we come to verses 10 and 11 of Hebrews chapter 12. And when God does step into our life and wreck us, and we're just kind of holding on to see what's going to happen, we read, God disciplines us for our good. It's not just about Him now. It's about us. He wants us to understand something coming out of this experience. And the writer continues, it doesn't seem pleasant. We don't enjoy it. It doesn't feel good. It's not a pleasurable moment by any stretch of the imagination. And yet, if we allow it, we can have a harvest where, where this training period can produce within us something that's special, something that's godly, something that's liberating, something that's honestly quite, quite powerful. Now, now we've talked about individuals to this point. Could God do this to a family? Could, could God really just step into the life of a family or a group? What about a church? Maybe there's a church that's just going along, thinking everything's fine, believing they're good, believing it falsely, though they're all convinced, they're all feeling good about things. And the writer of, uh, excuse me, the book of Revelation, Jesus actually talks to a church about this. He sends them a message through the apostle John. Here's what he says. Look, I know your deeds. I, I know that you are neither cold nor hot. I, I wish you were something, but you're just numb. You're just numb. You don't care about anybody. And, and the sad part is, you know, I'm about to just spit you out of my mouth. I'm about to be done with you. You're about to literally put a for sale sign in the yard and be done. And Jesus says, here's the problem. You, you, you say you're rich, you've acquired wealth, and you don't need a thing. You, you feel good. Again, you're pleasure seeking and you're doing well financially. So you think you're all right. This church of people, this entire church, but here's what he says, what you don't understand is you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're blind, you're poor, you're actually naked. You, what, what? Jesus is saying, listen, church, you're messed up. You think you're fine, but you're the exact opposite. What you literally think about you is not true at all. And here's what I need you to do. And if you don't do it, understand you will be done. So what do we, how do we respond? How do we respond when God steps into our lives and does something so powerful like this? Acts chapter 9, verse 6 gives us a great clue. Saul is sitting there blinded, doesn't know what to do, stands up. And God says, you know, obviously get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what must happen. So as we begin thinking about it, what's the, the first part? Well, this is obvious, is to get up. God's like, okay, don't just stay there. Don't just, you know... You know, feel bad for yourself. Don't just be overwhelmed by what's going on. I've got, I've got your attention. Now, get up. And that brings us to number two and start listening. You're going to be told what to do now, as he tells Saul here, go into the city, you know, put your phone on the table, put your spreadsheets aside, um, you know, put your laptop down. Not, not a time to analyze everything. Get up and start listening to me. Just go into the city is what Saul was told. And, and there you'll be told what needs to happen. And the final part is to be ready to do as God leads. Right? To get up, start listening, and be ready to do whatever God leads you to do. That's the process. That's the response God demands of us. Now, this third part, you might understand what in the world, or be wondering what that means. Well, over in Galatians, Saul, Paul would write these words to learn to be in step or in sync with the Spirit of God. That, that, that's the, the calling that we have is to be in step, in sync with Him um, along the way. And so we're, all right, we're getting up. We're not just going to sit here and feel sorry for ourselves or have a pity party or just be paralyzed. We're going to get up. We're going to start listening to God. All right, God, I'm, I'm going to quit, you know, listening to the voices I've, I've heard around me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start listening to you and then be ready to do whatever He leads. Now, now, this, uh, this 
three-step process that we just saw a moment ago very much is something that, uh, like Moses did. If you remember, Moses was just comfortably numb, running from, you know, the murder that he did in Egypt, and he's just in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness, taking care, married, taking care of the family's herd. And there's a bush on fire, and God says, get up and come over and check out the bush. And, and he's there, and he finds a bush burning, and yet it's not burning at all. And, and you're, God says, you're on, you're on holy ground. Listen to me. This is a powerful moment. And then I've got something I need you to do. I need you to go to Egypt, and there you'll set the people free. This was the invitation that Jesus gave his disciples. Come, follow me, and I'll make you people who change the world. And come, listen, look, get up and come with me. Follow me, listen to me, and I, I'll change your life, and I'll change your world. And, and, and here's what I need you to do. You're going to literally go into the world. And you're going to change, yes, you little band of Jewish guys, you know, from where you're located, you're going to go and change the world, literally turn it upside down. Maybe that describes you today. Maybe that's something in your life. You might think of a, maybe God's calling you to stop a habit. And God's like, okay, get up. It's time to stop the madness of this habit you have. It's time for you to, to end it. Um, it's time for you to focus on me and listening to what I'm saying. It's time for you to surround yourself with some other people overcoming the same habit. And listen, ahead's going to be some, some sizable challenges, but I want you to follow me and we're going to overcome this habit. It might be something like get involved, whether you're a, at a school or a church or in your neighborhood or in your city or town or community. And God's like, listen, you've sat on the sidelines too long. It's time to get up and get off the sidelines, get into the game realize, listen, listen carefully, I've created you, I've gifted you, I've given you experiences and wisdom, and, and, and we're going to do some amazing things. There's going to be some risk you got, you got to take. Maybe it's time to make a change. Maybe you're going to be a part of the great resignation that's going on in our country right now. God's got maybe a new place to live or a new job to take or a new opportunity to seize. And God's like, all right, get up. Not a time just to sit there and, you know, paralysis analysis, it's time to get up, start listening to me as I'm leading you to take some steps and understand we're going to just hang on. We're going to do some marching off the map. So as we come to the end, you know, it, it, as we talk about this, it's time for you. This, it's time for you. What, what's God been saying to you? What's God saying to you right now? What, what, what is the message God has for you, whether you're a believer or not, whatever your status in life? The second part, what are the hindrances for you hearing him right now? For some of you, it might be, okay, it's time to quit listening to the voices of the past. I mean, it's amazing to me how many dead people are still talking to people. And they're like, yeah, but you know, my mom, how long has she been gone? 20 years. It's time to just lay that voice aside. It's time to focus on hearing God. What is it God is saying to you? And then the third one we've seen already, you know, what is God leading you to do right now? Now, notice God didn't tell Saul. Now, Saul, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be a missionary. You're going to plant churches. You're going to go to Rome. You're going to do amazing things. He said, no, no, no. Go into the city. And when you get to the city, there, I will tell you what needs to happen next. See, for some of you, you're like sitting there, okay, God, I'm not going to do anything till you give me the agenda, the itinerary, the, the next 25 years of what's going to happen. God's like, no, I'm going to give you enough to know the next step. You're going to be in sync with me because we're going to do this one step at a time, one moment at a time as we go through the process. What is it God's saying to you? What are the hindrances that, that, that you're battling and hearing him and saying, okay, God, laying these things aside, I want to focus totally upon you. And then the third part, you know, what, what, is, what is he leading you to do right now? What's the next step he's leading you to take? And man, our prayer is whatever that might be, is you'll take that step. Whether you're right now saying, you know, I'm, I'm not a believer yet, or maybe you are, wherever you might be, and hang on, and we'll see you next week where we'll pick back up. Now, we realize for some of you right now, you've been listening and watching and maybe taking notes and have questions. Man, we'd love to know your questions. Perhaps you need to have a prayer request that flows out of this or God's stirring in your heart to take a step. And you're like, could you just pray with me about that step that I need to take? 
Any notes that come to me either through the mail or email are confidential, just come directly to me. So if you'd like to kick me something at gary.lewis at fbcrinkin.com, I'd love to check it out. Love you to send it my way. Or maybe you'd like to drop something in the mail to our mailing address, 201 East 6th Street, Rinkin, Georgia, 31326, and send it my way. Say, here's a prayer request, here's a need, here's a question, and we'll be happy to respond to whatever it is God is leading you to do because we want you to understand God's got a calling, learning to listen, leading you to take the next step and to hang on. Now, if you give uh, financially through our local church, we want you to understand some of that money is going to something we'd like to tell you about. We have a group that's actually in our service today at our church in person called Families for Families. Our good friend Shannon Ramsey here is hanging out with us, inviting people to ponder being a part of foster care and maybe even adoption in our state. But here's something you may not know about Georgia. We had, in 2021, nearly 14,000 kids involved in the foster care system. And you might think most of them are young. Truth is, most of them are between the ages of 6 and 18. And so we're trying to find a way to get involved in these kids' lives. And part of the resources you're bringing to us are going to help make that happen. Because the sad part, most kids in this age bracket are the ones that end up oftentimes in what we would call human trafficking. So we can eliminate that by getting them involved in families who can share with them the love of God. Man, that's truly what it's all about. So we invite you to prayerfully consider giving. There are different ways you can give. If you have any questions, you can go to our website at fbcrinkin.com. And FBC Rinkin is, is, you know, the basis for all of it. But you can see the many different ways. And we would love for you to partner with, in, with us in doing just that. Let me pray with you and we'll be done. Father, thank you for speaking to us through your word. Thank you that you love us enough. Sometimes you just wreck our life and catch us off guard because you need to help us to understand that we need to be corrected, rebuked, challenged, because maybe like Saul, we believe something for a long time that is not true. And you want to set us free and understand your amazing love. So I pray that will be true for so many. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care and have a great week. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, no. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside. one word and you revive every dream just one touch I feel the power of heaven just one touch my eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's nothing
greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of jesus i will believe for greater things there's no power 